Hello students, welcome to lecture 31 of the online course on nanophotonics, plasmonics and metamaterials. Today's lecture will be on transformation optics and invisibility clocks. So here is the lecture outline. So transformation optics will discuss about the basis of it, the fundamentals and what, the, what are the principles and mathematical forms in uh, this particular uh, field of science. And then we will take up some example of transformational optics and we will see how this helps us achieve some feature which are not naturally seen. Okay, um, Something like you can actually make materials that give you uh, refraction without reflection. And then you can also think of uh, refraction at normal incidence which is something not uh, naturally occurring in uh, the materials that we deal in day-to-day -day life. Okay, you can also uh, think about cylindrical focusing from a planar interface. Okay, so we'll look into all of this, and then finally we'll discuss about invi invisibility clocks. So let's introduce transformation optics to you. So the first thing that should come to your mind is that this is coming from some sort of coordinate transformation. Okay. So, the requirement for transformation optics comes from the fact that you want to bend light in a particular way depending on your will. So, you, you may argue that uh, there are graded index optics which allows you to do the same thing. So, yes, so graded index optics can be considered uh, that determines uh, how light can propagate in a medium with particular dielectric and magnetic properties. Now, when you take it further, you will be able to make uh, light to do any anything. Okay, so we'll look into those examples today. So, let us first start with graded index material and see what happens there. In graded index materials or GRIN, graded index green, okay, they allow optical rays to follow some curved trajectories which are basically governed by the profile of the refractive index and y and that is considered to be uh, constant along x and z but it only varies along y so you can think of something like this so here the refractive index basically varies only along the y direction so in this case there is a gradient along the y direction and as you can see a ray can get bent from this interface at a different angle so the incoming angle was theta which was function of the position y but then then it changes okay so this happens because this bending basically happens because the refractive index along y is also changing so you can say that at um, at a height of y it was n y okay and at a different height okay here the refractive index changes to n y plus the slope of this refractive index profile so that is d n over d y and then how much you have changed along y that is delta y so this gives you the new uh, refractive index at this particular point so this graded index materials allow you to uh, direct light and you, you can actually make light to take any band path. Now for isotropic materials with uh, graded electric permittivity epsilon r and magnetic permeability mu r, Maxwell's uh, equation will give rise to generalized Helmholtz equations which were solved for layered and uh, periodic structures such as uh, photonic crystals we have seen this already before now the synthesis problem of these uh, graded index materials is more challenging than the analysis problem in two respects first they will require much advanced mathematical tools as you can understand the refractive index continuously varies along one direction or the other and also the physical implementation of this kind of graded uh, medium will require the use of metamaterials constructed from the components that are available or which are basically configured in a particular 
uh, spatial arrangement okay and they should be supported by the current fabrication technology so these are the kind of requirements or you can say limitations getting imposed onto the graded index materials because of the current technology status so both mathematical you require um, you know advanced mathematical tools so the analytical study is difficult as well as the fabrication of uh, graded index materials will be challenging as well now to you know overcome these limitations you can think of transformational optics now transformational optics acts as a mathematical tool that facilitates the design of optical uh, materials which can guide light along any desired trajectory so you are able to achieve the similar functionality so uh, of the graded index optics but here also you can do a lot of uh, new stuff okay not a lot of new cool stuff i should say the underlying concept here lies on a geometrical transformation that converts simple trajectories into desired ones okay so in order that maxwell's equation will remain valid and the optical parameters associated with the transformed equivalent system must also be modified and this establishes the character of the required optical material so you require new kind of material to do this trick for you okay so as a simple example of such equivalence you can think of a local compression of the coordinate system by a scaling factor which is equivalent to the local increase in the refractive index by the same factor okay so it is like if you compress one uh, coordinate system by a scaling factor okay in one case you can and another case you increase the local refractive index by the same factor what will happen the optical path length in both the cases will be similar okay and how optical path length is de defined it is the physical length multiplied by the uh, refractive index okay so in one case the physical length is coming down refractive index is remaining same in other case the physical length remains same but the refractive index is scaling up so their product remains same okay so that is the optical path length so a local compression of the coordinate system so if you are compressing any material along z direction by a factor of a that can be also assumed to have you know similar effect as if you have the same dimensions along z but the material now have a refractive index n a n was the previous refractive index now it will have n a refractive index okay now transformational optics let us see how you do the design so there is a three step design procedure which will provide the guidance so you first begin with a pilot physical system for which the optical trajectories are known such as a homogeneous and isotropic material and then you find a coordinate transformation that convert these trajectories to the desired ones okay and then you um, determine the transformed physical parameters of the equivalent material so this is the third step and with this new material you will be able to um, obtain the desired optical trajectories in the original coordinate system so this is what you are looking for okay so you want the features to work in the original coordinate system so using this kind of uh, transformational optics you transfer the desired configuration you can say onto the material properties okay and then you put that new material into the previous coordinate system i will take examples it will become clear more clear in the subsequent slides so since uh, geometrical transformations generally involve changes of directions and introduce direction dependent scaling the transform parameters are generally both anisotropic and spatially varying okay so this is how you will get the transform parameters so let us consider you know um, 
epsilon ij is a tensor this is the permittivity tensor and uh, mu ij as a permeability tensor of the original material in the original coordinate system so original coordinate system has the three axes x1 x2 and x3 okay now the elements of the permeability permittivity and permeability tensors of the equivalent material okay so that can have a superscript of e that is the equivalent material that will bring the desired functionality okay and this will be in the transform coordinate system u1 u2 and u3 okay are then related to the original elements of this one by this equation so you can obtain what is the equivalent materials permittivity and permeability tensor so you can see here that you require a matrix a and this matrix a is a 3 by 3 jacobian transformation matrix okay so and what are the elements of this matrix so the matrix elements a i j is nothing but dou u i over dou x j where i and j are basically 1 2 3 so the matrix elements are basically basically partial derivatives u is basically the transformed coordinate system and xj is basically representing the original coordinate system so once you know this this matrix a which is a jacobian matrix you can find out what is the equivalent materials permittivity that is a transpose then you have this uh, epsilon a divided by the determinant of this matrix a similar equation is used also for permeability okay now this we have seen the jacobian uh, transformation matrix these are the elements now when you have this a transpose okay this actually um, is required to calculate this um, equivalent material properties and epsilon and mu they are also 3 by 3 matrices whose elements are this one okay so you can represent the elements as epsilon ij and mu ij fine now since the jacobian matrix a is generally dependent on x1 x2 and x3 the equivalent material that you will see will be in generally inhomogeneous even if the original material that you started with was homogeneous okay now in a special case when the original material is both homogeneous and isotropic something like free space okay in that case you will see that epsilon and mu these tensors are basically or these matrices are basically uh, diagonal and they have equal uh, diagonal elements mu naught and epsilon naught okay so in those case you can uh, simplify the equation and you can write um, epsilon naught inverse epsilon e that will be equal to mu naught inverse mu e equals this okay this is the determinant of a inverse a transpose a okay that is basically coming from those previous equations there is nothing new here just that here things got simplified because you have only the diagonal elements and another important thing is here mu and epsilon are similar okay so the tensors epsilon e and mu e are then identical okay except for a scaling factor okay so only the scaling factors are different other than them they are similar now under these conditions the impedance okay so what happens to the impedance the impedance depends on the ratio of the permittivity and permeability okay and uh, they will remain unchanged okay because both of them got a uh, factor okay and so the ratio will remain same and that actually helps you because when the ratio remains unchanged for all the polarization you can consider this equivalent medium will have no reflection at any boundary with the free space so it becomes a reflection free boundary okay so let's um, see a number of examples now to understand the transformation principle 
So, this is the first example that we will be discussing today. Let us try to create a refraction without reflection. So, usually if you have seen that you know refraction and reflection both come together, but you are able to uh, make some uh, material here which can actually give you only, only refraction and no reflection. So, the optical material shown here okay, shows the ray trajectory where it only refracts. So, these are the rays incoming angle is theta 1 and the refracted angle is theta 2. Okay. So, this is the geometrical transformation that implements the refraction without reflection kind of feature. Now, how do you begin designing this kind of a system? Okay. So, let us first start with an initial homogeneous medium, say free space, okay, where the um, lines will follow the straight parallel trajectories at angle theta 1 something like this okay so this we need to design the material for this one that does this kind of bending right so this is our desired optical trajectory now we are starting with by assuming that this part is basically free space so if it is free space what will happen there will be straight line optical trajectories right there will be no bending or anything now, it is our time to apply the geometric transformation. Now, if you apply geometric transformation in the form of stretching the coordinate system by a scale factor of s along s3 x3 direction for the part where x3 is greater than 0. So, only this positive half. So, this part is x3 less than 0. We will do nothing to it. Okay, because this is the part that we want. We only want things to change here on the right side okay, of this particular line. So, we want to stretch this portion which is where x3 is greater than 0. And when you do the stretching, you actually get something like this. So, you see, you, you just stretched the entire coordinates by a factor of s. So, all these lines, they got stretched. Okay. So, stretching the coordinate system by a factor of s for x3 greater than 0, okay, this one will cause the rays to change their slope and now they will be able to follow the desired trajectory, understood? So, we started with free space where the lines were simply going straight, then we stretched this axis so that you, you acquire the slope that you want to be in your desired uh, optical response. Okay. So, the desired refraction is achieved by choosing s as a ratio of the initial and the desired slope. So, you can choose s as 10 theta 1 over 10 theta 2. This is how you can find out the stretching factor. And once you have that, you can find out the relationship between the transformation. So, this is where the transformation is coming. So, this is the transformed axis. So, as you can see in other two, um, so this is this, the plane is basically the x1. So, x1 axis is coming out of, so sorry, the plane is x1 equals 0, right. So, x1 is coming out of this screen. So, u1, the new coordinate system, u1 is same as x1. There is no change in this one, this direction. Similarly, you are not stretching along x2. So, that also remains same. So, y2 equals x2. Only thing has changed is u, this is sorry, u2 equals x2 and uh, only thing that is changing is u3. So, u3 is nothing but s inverse x3. So, that is how you are stretching it. Okay. So, this type of scaling of the coordinate uh, Cartesian coordinate system in which the direction of the axis does not change. So, what they will do? They will basically convert a cube into a cuboid, right. So, now you have known the transformation. Let us find out what is the Jacobian matrix for this. So, Jacobian matrix A i j can be calculated as dou ui over dou x j. So, that way you can fill up all these uh, partial derivatives and using these relationships shown here, you can calculate all this and they boil down to a very simple equation 
uh, simple uh, matrix that is this one. Okay. So, 1 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 s inverse. So, this is the Jacobian matrix. So, here you can see the Jacobian matrix is basically a diagonal one where the diagonal elements are 1 1 s inverse. Okay. And you can also calculate the determinant of this matrix A that will come out to be s inverse. Now, once you know all these parameters, you can easily find out that what will be the effective permeability of the new medium okay so you can go back to this particular equation okay and you can now see what happens because this all factors are known okay you can do the computation and you will see that epsilon not inverse epsilon e equals mu not inverse mu e equals this so the elements are s s and 1 by s okay now since the matrices that uh, permittivity and permeability of the equivalent material they are diagonal okay the anisotropic material has principal axis pointing along the axis of the coordinate systems okay that is clear and the values in this case are epsilon 1 will be s epsilon naught epsilon 2 will also be s epsilon naught wherever epsilon 3 will be s inverse epsilon naught Similarly, you can find out what is the permeability along the three direction 1, 2 and 3. Okay? So, mu 1 will be s mu naught, mu 2 will be s mu naught, mu 3 will be s inverse mu naught. Okay? So, this is basically the requirement of the new material which has to be replaced on this right side. Okay? So, we understood that the parameters of the equivalent material may be obtained my batching this okay so what are the requirements we are fulfilling here the phase shift that is encountered when a plane wave crosses the stretched free space uh, segment with the phase shift encountered when the wave is transmitted through a unstretched segment filled with this new material and this new material will have all this property okay so, the whole idea is the phase shift that will be there for the light should be equivalent in both the cases and then only you will be able to you know uh, fill the unstretched segment with the new material and that is how you will be able to bend the light without any reflection. Okay? So, to determine the parameters we consider three waves in turn each with the electric field along the uh, along one of the coordinates. Okay? So, let us consider uh, one wave that is wave 1. Okay? So, wave 1 is a plane wave traveling along the x 3 direction. Okay? So, this is x 3 direction with electric and magnetic fields along x 1 and x 2 directions respectively. So, in that case the appropriate permittivity and permeability are basically epsilon 1 and mu 2. And what is the relationship? So, k will be omega square root of epsilon 1 mu 2 and you can write omega epsilon 1 is basically s omega naught mu 2 is s mu naught. So, you can take out s and this thing actually gives you s k naught. Okay? So, the wave vector is basically s times the k naught in this new material. Okay? Now, this actually implies that the refractive index is basically s in n 1 direction. In the original material stretched material the refractive index was 1. So, here it is s. So, the phase shift that will be accumulated over the distance d can then be written as s k naught into d. And you can find out what is the impedance. Impedance will be eta 1 which is equivalent to square root of mu 2 over epsilon 1. Now, this is what was mentioned before that there will be a scaling factor. Okay? So, if you see that the scaling factor appears both places, so they will basically cancel out and you will get the impedance to be same as the uh, free space. So, in that case what happens? That is the reflection. So, that is for one particular wave. Now, if you consider another wave, wave 2 
that is also traveling along x three direction, but the electric and magnetic field directions are now changed. So, now electric field is considered to be along x two direction okay, and uh, magnetic field is along minus x one direction. So, this is x one. So, you can understand which one is minus x one. Okay. So, in this case uh, the wave again travels with a refractive index n 2 equals s and you can find out the impedance eta 2 will be same as eta naught. It is the same calculation as the previous one. So, we are not repeating it. Then you can also think of the third wave. So, this is wave 3. Now, wave 3 travels along uh, this direction x 2 direction with the electric field along x 3 and magnetic field along x 1 direction. So, in that case what happens? You can see that the approximate permittivity and permeability are basically epsilon 3 and mu. Okay? So, it should be actually mu 1 because it is along uh, x 1 direction. So, consider this as mu 1 and you can then calculate what is the k. So, k will be omega square root of epsilon 3 uh, mu 1 and epsilon 3 can be written as s inverse epsilon naught and mu 1 can be written as s mu naught. So, s inverse and s they cancel out each other you get the same wave vector. Okay? In that case the refractive index along n 3 direction is also 1. Okay? So, we have figured out all the cases. Okay? So, you can calculate the phase shift along this direction that will be simply k naught d and this is similar in the un unstretched case because there is actually no uh, stretching along the x 2 direction. So, let us calculate what is the impedance here. The impedance will be eta 3 equals square root of mu 1 over epsilon 3 and that will come out to be s eta naught. Okay? So, you can see that there is a change in impedance in this particular direction. Now, using these results, you can conclude the design that uh, you know the final design is basically a piecewise homogeneous. So, this material is one material, this is another material that is why they are shown in different colors. Okay? And uh, the left half of the free space is basically uh, this sorry left half is basically free space and right half is basically a anisotropic material and this is also if you see this is basically a uh, two axes are same and third one is different so you say uniaxial material okay and this anisotropic material as i mentioned it is birefringent because along two direction it has got the same refractive index, but along the third direction it has got a different refractive index. Okay? Now, the boundary in the boundary along uh, the free space, okay, the interesting thing what is the boundary along free space that is along x n, x 1 and x 2. These are the boundary along the free space. So, you see the impedance in those direction eta 1 and eta 2 is same as eta naught. It means there is no impedance mismatch with the, at the boundary with the free space. So, there will be no reflection. So, you can only have transmission. Okay? So, the two factors that distinguish uh, refraction at the boundary of this synthesized anisotropic medium from the conventional refraction at a boundary of uh, a homogeneous and isotropic medium is that here the refraction that you are getting does not come with a reflection. Okay? And second thing is that the relationship between the angle of incidence that is theta 1 and the angle of refraction theta 2 is different here. Here it is S 10 theta 2 equals 10 theta 1. So, this is different than Snell's law. So, you can actually define your own law if you have your own material. Okay? So, this is how you can get your desired refraction without any reflection if you are able to realize this anisotropic uniaxial material. Okay? So, now let us move on to the next 
example that is refraction at normal incidence. Now normally uh, there is no refraction at the normal incidence. Okay? So here we are trying to design that as well. So consider the design of an optical material that implements refraction at an angle theta at normal planar surface. So this is what is the desired optical trajectory. So this is the interface okay? and light is falling normally but then still you want a uh, angle theta. So this type of uh, refraction cannot occur at the boundary between two isotropic dielectric material but they can occur at the boundary between one isotropic and another anisotropic material. So this possibility is there. Okay? So we will start in the same process with a pilot system of free space where the ray trajectory is along the horizontal uh, parallel straight lines something like this okay? and then we will try to implement the coordinate transformation. So first thing is, so this is where the right side is basically a free space and that is where you are able to see straight line. Okay? These are parallel straight lines. But then what you want, you want this to bend at an angle of uh, theta. So you can actually think of this kind of transformation that u1, the new transform coordinate u1 will be equal to x1 but x2 there has to be some change. Okay? So the new coordinate system u2 will have x2 plus s x3 okay? and u3 will remain same as x3. So you can use this kind of a um, transformation so and you are only applying this transformation for the positive x3 and what is s? s is basically 10 theta. So this is the angle theta at which you want this refracted rays to go. So you can use this over here. So once you know that this is this will be obtained when you apply this particular transformation. Okay? So this transformation will deflect the trajectories as desired and this is done by shearing along the x2 direction. So you are actually changing the coordinates along the x2 direction. So, sharing the coordinate system along x2 direction for the positive half will refract the trajectories as shown here. Okay? So, this is what you want. So, it will become like this because you are sharing it. Ah, so, along x2 things will change and that change is basically bringing this angle theta. Okay? So, how do you do now? So, now we have to find a material that does it for us. Okay? So we have to again go back to find out the permittivity and permeability tensor of the equivalent anisotropic material and you can use the same formula that is uh, epsilon naught inverse epsilon e will be equal to mu naught inverse mu e should be equal to that determinant of a inverse then a transpose and you have a. Okay? So that is the equation once you do it you will get only the diagonal elements they are 1 1 okay no here you get also some off diagonal elements okay so you get 1 0 0 0 1 s 0 s 1 plus s square so this represents a homogeneous but anisotropic medium okay so once you are able to replace this uh, you know new material which is in blue color okay with this which will have this kind of property then you can go back to the previous coordinate system okay? and it, you will get the same effect. The third example shows cylindrical focusing. So again here you have a planar interface but this is the desired optical trajectory. So you want to achieve a uh, cylindrical fo focusing functionality. So what you have? You have parallel um, straight line trajectories on the left side that needs to be refracted from a planar boundary so that they meet at a focal point say uh, capital F at a distance of small f from the boundary. Okay? So first what you will do? You consider these as a free space. Okay? So you start, so when it is a free space they will be all parallel 
straight line optical trajectory and then you have to apply the coordinate transformation here so that this kind of feature is obtained. So, in this case we will be using this uh, particular feature that will focus at a point. So, again there is no changes uh, along uh, x 1 direction. So, u 1 is same as x 1 and u 2 and u 3 will be changed as this equation. So, one will be sine function of x 2 over f another one is a cosine function. So, this will actually change the right side into a cylindrical coordinate system okay? and this centers at u 2 equals 0 and u 3 equals f. Okay? So, this particular transformation converts the right side into a cylindrical coordinate system so that you are able to get this focusing effect. So, what is happening? This particular transformation basically converts a line that is x 2 equals a okay, in the plane x 1 equals 0 that is this particular screen you can think this screen is x 1 equals 0 in the original coordinate system into a line that is u 2 equals f minus u 3 tan a over f in the new coordinate system. So, this is how it they are getting uh, focused or they will meet somewhere and you will get this. Okay? And if you consider um, x 3 equals b that is this particular lines that you see here because of this coordinate transformation all these lines will be now converted into circles and I will not go into the mathematics of it, but I will just tell you that they will get converted into circles and these are the equations of the circles u 2 square plus f minus u 3 square will be equal to f minus b square. So, this tells you that the radius will be f minus b and the circle will be centered at 0 f that, that is basically u 2 and u 3 coordinates. So, with that you are able to uh, do this particular focusing. Now, once the coordinate transformation is fixed, now you know how to obtain your uh, values of epsilon e and epsilon mu e. They can be done using this formula. Okay? So, you do the calculation again. In the same manner, you will be able to find out what is this matrix. They are again diagonal matrix. So, epsilon naught inverse epsilon e, e will be equal to mu naught inverse mu e that is s 0 0 0 s inverse 0 and 0 0 s. What is s here? s is basically f over modulus of x 3 minus f. So, with that you can understand that the permittivity and permeability tensors of the equivalent medium they have the same principal axis along x 1, x 2 and x 3 axis. Okay? But the principal values of the permittivity and permeability tensors are dependent on the position x 3. So, this is important because s is basically all dependent on this particular position. Okay? That is the equivalent material is basically graded along the x 3 direction with larger anisotropy near the focal line. So, when this goes to very close to the focal line this value will be very large. Okay? So, this is a kind of uh, larger anisotropy that is what they are discussing. Okay? So, here these parameters are basically function of x 3 and that is why they are all graded. Okay? So, you can understand that creating such material could be challenging, but this particular tool uh, of transformation optics can allow you to think of this kind of materials which can do all these unusual optical transformations. With that, let us move on to the next topic that is invisibility clocks, which is basically an application of this transformation optics. So, a, an invisibility clock is a device that can guide light around an object such that the object appears transparent and therefore, it is invisible. So, here is an example say you have an object here, okay? but the trajectory shows that you are basically avoiding this sphere A and you are allowing the light to go through in this shell and they will exit this 
at the same point where this was so all these four points will be in the straight line with these four points so it will look like as if there is nothing in between this so this is how clocking works so anything any object that you can put in between will not be seen okay so this is the desired optical trajectory in this case so again how do you design this kind of a system you can start with a free space Cartini Cartesian coordinate system which has got all uh, parallel straight line kind of optical trajectories okay and then you have to bring in the coordinate transformation so you can convert to a coordinate system which has got u1 u2 and u3 such that uh, the points of the sphere with radius r okay so you can think of radius r r is having um, say square root of x1 square plus x2 square plus xc square they are basically mapped onto a um, sphere of radius u which is greater than a so that you know this all these points are basically mapped outside so coordinate transformation mapping points inside the sphere to points within a spherical shell outside the sphere will allow you to get the desired response so what you are doing basically all the points that is inside this sphere of radius a has to be moved onto this shell okay that way there will be no light inside okay so this is accomplished for all the points where r the radius is less than b okay and um, b is basically greater than a so this is what you want to do all these points has to be mapped here okay so you can actually use a transformation like this u equals a plus b minus a over b times r so you can see what happens to the point over here okay you can put r equal um, 0 you can put uh, r equals a okay and you can find out what is happening to this transformation so this is the transformation that allows you to do that and when r varies to b okay you can see that as r varies from 0 to b u will vary from a to b okay so the entire thing from 0 to b is the entire space so the entire space in the real coordinate system is basically now mapped onto the new coordinate system which has got u and in that case everything falls within a to b so what you are doing the entire system including this uh, thing is mapped onto this shell now okay so this mapping can also be written as u equals s r times r where s r is basically okay like this a over r plus b minus a over b so you are just bringing r in the denominator so this becomes a position dependent scaling factor so if you try to uh, think of this in terms of scaling so you can think that this is position dependent scaling factor okay so now it is your task to uh, apply this so when applied um, isotropically the scaling factor will bring this particular uh, coordinate transformation so all the coordinates x1 x2 and x3 will get transformed okay by this uh, coordinate by this scaling factor and what will be the result the points on the straight line uh, say x2 equals f in the plane x equals 0 okay of this one so x2 equals f is say this one okay will now get it get uh, mapped into the curve trajectory okay one of these trajectories in u2 u3 plane so this is how all of them will now go around so all these straight lines will now take this particular curved trajectories okay so this one you can think of like this going around the top one you can think of like this because of this transformation so you can also write u2 square plus u3 square equals a square u2 over u2 minus b minus a times f by b whole square okay so this is the trajectory that you are seeing here so the red curves are computed using this one 
and these are the four values you can also see these are two and two so these are the four values so this is how the top two goes to this two curved red lines the bottom two and the bottom two red curved lines okay so that is how you are able to do it and the grid that is shown in this figure within the shell uh, that where u is like in between a b and you can actually obtain this using this particular relationship so there is nothing here so the entire space of radius 0 to b has been moved on to this shell so now you can put anything here doesn't matter light will never enter this but it will go around and it will exit from this side but these two points will look they are as if coming straight without any deviation so that is how your cloaking will work okay so you can also think of similar kind of uh, mapping for x3 so x3 equals f is this one okay and you can think of putting this on this plane so that is how you are getting this curved grids now once you know the parameters or uh, the transformation the parameters of the equivalent material to be placed in this shell spherical shell will be now determined by these equations okay so these are the equations we started with this is the jacobian matrix this is the transformation okay this is the relationship of the transformation scaling factor okay this is how the transformation has finally come up from straight lines to this kind of curved lines once you know all these things you can find out that you require the material equivalent permittivity and permeability to have these values okay where v square is basically u, u to the power 4 over uh, 2au minus a square where u is basically ranging from 0 to yeah, sorry a to b so this is how this shell has to be replaced by this kind of material that will do this trick for you so as you can see this is a bit mathematically intensive but this kind of things are possibility so what is understood here is that the dielectric and the magnetic properties of this kind of materials in this spherical shell are both inhomogeneous and anisotropic for example if you take uh, at points on the x1 axis okay that is uh, u00 you will have this kind of a value okay and if you at all these points the principal axis are anyways aligned to the three coordinate uh, cartesian coordinates u1 x1 x2 and x3 and you can think of the principal value u1 that varies from 0 to epsilon b minus a over b so this is the range over which epsilon 1 will vary because u is varying from a to b similarly the values of uh, however you can see here there is no variation so epsilon 2 and epsilon 3 will be simply b over b minus a times epsilon naught so the values along 2 and 3 direction will be same but along epsilon 1 it will change the so similar result will apply for mu as well and with that you can see that if you go to the implementation at optical wavelengths the implementation of invisibility clocks via metamaterials will require the use of advanced nanofabrication technology something like electron beam or focused ion beam lithography we will look into the details of these different techniques in the subsequent lectures but you can also see because there is change gradient graded one in the val the graded values so you have to think of constituent uh, dielectric and magnetic elements to be of various shapes and dimensions and they must be intricately designed and precisely laid out so that makes this thing very challenging so such um, you know elements will be highly resonant and the electromagnetic properties of the material will depend strongly on the wavelength so such devices will typically work over a very very narrow spectral bandwidth and you i hope you are able to understand the challenge here that you require meta material to realize this kind of special functionalities like anisotropy in the 
permittivity and permeability and after that also it will work only over a very narrow bandwidth. So, with that we come to an end to this lecture. So, we will be discussing uh, carpet cloaking and other transformation optics metamaterial devices in the next lecture. So, if you have any query you can drop an email to me mentioning MOOC in the subject line. Thank you. Thank you.